Let's see what's out there. Hello and welcome to Home Media Minefield presents Let's See What's Out There, an entertainment video stream and podcast focused on movies and TV shows. My name's Keith Isles and I am a film and television enthusiast and for today's bonus episode I am really delighted to welcome back uh, somebody that we had on previously on one of our shows, um, the animator uh, Justin T. Lee. Now, um, before I bring him into the show, I'll just say he's from Gazelle Automations, uh, and we had him on previously because he had done an animation that was based on an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, but presented in the style and format of the 1970s filmation Star Trek animated series. And it was rather successful and uh, quite inspiring. So we, we had him on to talk about that. He has since gone away to do uh, another animation, this time based on a Star Trek Voyager episode. So I would say that if you haven't actually seen this yet, I'm going to put links to this in the show notes below. Pause this video. I hate to send you away, but you'll get more out of it if you pause this video. Go and watch that excellent uh, animation. I think it's about six minutes running time, approximately. Go and do that and then come back and, uh, and, and check this out. And um, we'll talk in more detail about that. But without any further ado, it brings gives me great pleasure to welcome back Justin T. Lee. Welcome, Keith. Justin. Keith, thanks for having me back, and uh, thank you for the the uh, not only that glowing introduction, but also you uh, updated the graphic. You got oh. some new stills on there. I mean, <laughs> yes. all sorts of uh, awesome. So thank you. I, yeah, yeah, I yeah. thought I better put. I thought I better put. Not only we've got a couple of pictures there from uh, you know the next gen episode you did, but also from from this new Voyager episode. So okay. yes, I just thought, uh, why not? Why not do that? Um, now. Obviously, we're, we're going to go through the whole sort of story here and history and everything. Um, my usual co-host on the uh, Star Trek streams that we do, Pete Mealy, uh, unfortunately, he can't join us today. He's he's not well this weekend, so uh, we hope he gets better soon. Absolutely. So I'm solo with you today. Uh, but as you well know from the previous one, I, I've got no shortage of questions, right? So... I thought I'd start before we talk about the process and the history and all of this sort of thing. I would get the elephant out of the room to mm. start with. And, and that is, obviously, when you chose to do this for Star Trek The Next Generation, you chose one of the probably the most loved and best known episodes ever by doing a, a piece from the best of both worlds part one, mm -hmm. which uh, everybody knows. And, and, you know, it's on most people's top 10 of Star Trek episodes in history. List, yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. What I find interesting here, and I've got to ask this. So you have chosen uh, for this animation, um, an episode of Star Trek Voyager. I, I'm a yeah. bigger Voyager apologist, by the way. I love Star Trek Voyager. We don't need to apologize things. for Voyager. Voyager's fun. <laughs> but, like, there's a lot of love for Voyager. They're making a documentary right now, as I'm sure exactly. you know. Yeah, I can't. I can't wait. But you chose uh, a season two episode mm -hmm. called Threshold. Yes. Now, I'm going to pretend I'm not having any kind of reaction to what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I know dot, Threshold. Dot, and yes. <laughs> well, Threshold. Um, you know, it's not a widely known episode always. And I know it's got its 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 fans out there, but it is an episode that has been quite reviled by some of the fan base. And this is the first indeed, I'm hearing of this, Keith. I've never heard about this before. <laughs> and indeed, the uh, even even the filmmakers themselves have actually gone on record to say that this was a really bad episode. It isn't canon and all sorts of stupid things. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, why did you choose Threshold? Uh, I think actually, um, so obviously, yes, Pink Elephant in the Room. Pink Elephant? Sure. Because uh, <laughs> Filmation. Um, I hope that doesn't mean anything else. So oh, the, that's brilliant. That's yeah, brilliant. I love the, it. <laughs> um, the, you know what? I think what sums it up the best is there are loads of, of comments. I've been reading uh, some of the comments on the video and on social media as I've been. I mean, again, just like with the last one, totally surprising and really thrilled that so many people are enjoying this. 
and majority of the comments are very positive and yep. lots of them say of course this is the right episode to pick to do this to of course it is like and that made me so happy because that's how i felt i was like because i was really racking my brain when i finally decided i was going to do another one um which took quite a while to get around to to, to decide to do because it was just it was a stupid amount of work to do the first one and i thought why i why do i want to do this again but i was like well, i kind of want to see what voyager would look like if it was um in a filmation style and yeah. you know there are voyager fans and all that sort of thing and then i was going through a list of possible episodes uh this wasn't even my first i i, I said this elsewhere as well like i actually started working on a different episode like i started work oh, really? on some other thing and then i was like oh it's not really working and I'm going through lists of, you know, the top 10 Voyager episodes and the most memorable from season, whatever. And I kept thinking, oh, I don't know about this. Um, something else, another comment that stuck with me was when the TNG went out. Um, it might have just been one comment and you shouldn't let one comment stay in your head. But the one comment said, uh, you know, after I watched your cartoon, I was watching Best of Both Worlds Part One. And when Picard was abducted, I saw your cartoon in my head and I thought, oh, that's not good. Because, and, and just to be clear, I don't think that's a problem specifically. And it doesn't mean that I was necessarily going, now I have to pick one that, that there won't be any problem if I like corrupted it in, in the fans' minds. I mean, there's room for, I mean, you know, Lego Star Wars exists and it doesn't corrupt people's view of Star Wars, right? Like they can enjoy both. But yeah. I did start to think because of that comment, what if I go down a very, different road and it's funny you say that threshold is maybe not the most best known episode of of star trek i feel like if you're a star trek fan and you've seen it there's absolutely no way you'll forget about it like you'll never yeah. forget this salamander lizard sex kids and like you'll never forget it and so um there's that aspect to it yeah. it's, it's it's a loud idea and and again thankfully so many people said of course, this was always meant to be a cartoon. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it was, I, I mean, let's be honest, Playmates, I think it was, made a special action figure. They did. They based did, on yes. this episode, didn't yep. they? So, so they, so there you go. I mean, that was years ago, but that was, that was one thing. Um, I have to say, you, you've kind of reintroduced it to me because I have to admit, um, you know, Voyager, Voyager season two was a mm -hmm. bit of a mixed bag. I've always yeah. thought that ever since it first aired. And I loved Voyager. Uh, I mm -hmm. still think actually that the pilot of Voyager, Caretaker, is one of the strongest Star Trek pilots that it's exists. It's, it's, it's very strong. It's a really, yeah. I mean, far points a mess. I think I, everyone will agree. Come on. It is. And, yeah. um, and uh, Emissary, while it, for a great show, my thought and my wife Lindsay's thought when we watched it was they they had to cram a lot of exposition in and it kind of bogs the story down. So even though you've got movie of the week length runtime, you know, you've got Odo just throwing in, I never knew who my people were. Let's go find out. And he's just like, what is going like so many things are, you know, and Dax is talking about her thing. So, no, you're right. Uh, caretaker. Um, you know, Keith, the only thing I think of when I think of caretaker and it is a good pilot is those um Ocompan elevators, uh, escalators. And I just think that's just so funny that, you know, 70, <laughs> was it 70? How far away are they? 70, 70,000 yeah. light years. Yeah, I'm, I should know this. I'm a yeah, big yeah. Star Trek fan. It's 70 something <laughs> light years. Um, I feel really bad that I don't know it right now. Um, away from Earth, and they've got escalators on, on Ocampa. Mm. Anyway. That's yeah, fine. no, I, I know what you mean. Um, yeah. But, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, you, you know, um, this episode, I went back to re because I didn't want to watch your animation actually until I'd rewatched this episode. Oh, I really? <laughs> well, I wanted to do the um, I wanted to do this sort of A B comparison type right. thing. So I went back and fortunately, uh, these here in the UK, these episodes of Voyager are still on Netflix and they're yep. still available mm -hmm. uh, because one of the controversies here at the moment is we don't have Paramount Plus yet. We're getting it. It's later coming. Month, yes. But yeah. Mm -hmm. So I've not been able to watch any of Strange New Worlds, and I've been trying. Oh, to avoid and you know that that's that's shot here, and of course, and you know what? Here's the here's the other thing. This is going to really disappoint you. Disappointed me. Uh, I was asked to work on it the other day, and oh, wow. to to puppeteer on it, and I had to say no because I had an, I had another job. 
Oh, yeah. No. And so, yeah, they were saying, like, because I, I obviously, I, I'm a puppeteer. Yes. And it's shot, and Strange New Worlds is shot here. And right. my puppeteer friend called and said, Are you free to, I don't, am I allowed to talk about this? Sure. I mean, because, like, that, it's, yeah. I'm not allowed okay. to say what it was. In fact, I didn't. I don't know what it was. Yeah, like... but, but but I was I was asked if I was free to work on it, and I was like, oh, I, I've got another job. So it was just uh, it was too bad. But my friends are working on it here, and of course, it's shot um, in Toronto. And in wow. fact, the other day, did I see them shooting? I might have seen them shooting. There were there were at, um, a really um, popular intersection, a really busy intersection in Toronto. Um, that's when um, that photo leaked of. Um, uh, Captain Kirk. Oh, that's right. Yeah, on the street, yeah. like they were outside the big shopping mall uh, downtown Toronto. Anyway, right. That's neither here nor there. But, no, no, um, no, 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 no. Yeah. And this is really, this is really cool, and uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm both impressed, but also unhappy for you that you weren't able to do it. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but um, you, you know, it's good to be talking to someone that's that's been that close, if you like. So yeah. that's that's amazing. But um, no, I went back and watched Threshold, and. Um, I found it kind of interesting because I, I, I'd sort of forgotten about it, to be honest. And um, I'm amazed, you know, Keith. I'm amazed you could. It's just, I mean, maybe it's like a fever dream and you're just like, that never happened. And then you go back <laughs> and go, oh, wait, yes, it did. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I rewatched it and I'm a, I'm a big, when, when Voyager first came out, I was, I mean, you, you know, the character I wanted to be in Voyager was Tom Paris. You know, mm. it was kind of, that was the character that I sort of related to and, and, you know, Fly boy. To, <laughs> the, the, yeah. the, the pilot flyboy, cool well, flyboy yeah. dude. Yeah. yeah there, there we go. So yeah. it, was, it was the Han Solo, right? Yes. Show, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 you even kind of dress like Han Solo right now. I just oh, there we go. Yeah, out. not yes. not intentionally, but okay. there you go. Okay. Uh, yep. but, yeah, Corellian smuggler. There you yep. go. That's my mm -hmm. uh, But no, um, so so uh, you know you know I like Tom Paris. So it's obviously as a Tom Paris centric episode. And the other thing is, and it really made me realize it rewatching it. I'm a big Cronenberg fan. There you go. The there flying. you go. Yes. Yeah. And that's and this and, felt yeah. like a sort of TV version. As far as they could go on primetime TV, because obviously they yeah. couldn't have like the Brundlefly face falling apart thing, but they did yeah. have Paris pull his tongue out and that kind that of grotesque. That made me think of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it was the reaction when he did it as well, the kind of little, he looked back and did the little smile and it so made me think of Jeff Goldblum in I that. Failed. Hundred <laughs> percent. I'm I'm sure um, Brandon Braga and the production team. They must, of course, they were thinking of the fly. It's like Voyager's version. And yeah. hats off to the seriously the makeup people. Makeup um, is very good in this episode. Pretty good. Very very good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, the production values and, and the performances. You know, it's 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 all actually pretty good. It's just such a bizarre episode. Um, and uh, I think that's I think maybe that's why it's got that sort of. It's got a bit of a reputation because it, it was um you, it, doesn't, you know, it doesn't make any sense keith it doesn't make any sense it doesn't make any sense but 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 what what i what i was um uh you, you know what what sort of struck me with it and also actually i've just realized while we're saying this so cronenberg i suppose mm. there's there's now a in-universe connection to cronenberg because of course the last lot of um discovery that i saw cronenberg played a character in mm -hmm. there so mm -hmm. uh there mm -hmm. you go it's all full circle and he but... as you know maybe you know this he loves filming in toronto right um and so he yeah. films a lot and so the fly was filmed in toronto there you in go. fact i feel like once because i'm a big nerd i i swear i went looking for where that loading dock is you know where they shoot the exterior of of Brundle's apartment. I don't know yeah. if it's still there because, like, you know, a lot of um, urban development has knocked down old buildings and stuff, but it might oh, still yeah. be there. Anyway. Yeah. The, oh, you know, it is, you know, That's it is weird. still there. Sorry, this is not a Star Trek related thing, but in the movie, in The Fly, you can see out the office window, there's like a building that's got a painting of windows on it. I don't know if you remember the scene, but that building is still there. That is the oh, um, Flatiron right. building downtown Toronto. That's still there and it still has that painting of windows on it. So anyway. Oh, there you go. Very cool. Very cool. We'll have to do a a, a Cronenberg fly. There you uh, go. Episode. Yeah, yeah. The fly franchise. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, clearly but, they did. Yeah, yeah exactly. No, um, but but yeah. So I went back and watched it, and and um, uh, you know, I was as I said, I was I was struck by it, and then I went to watch your um, your animation, and what I. In fact, I have done a slide. What when yeah. I last when we, when we talked about the next gen episode, what I did was that the slide that I created for that, I 
you know, I was scrambling to try and find pictures and screen grabs and stuff. But I was putting how you had really emulated the animated series. So I was yeah. showing, you know, shots from the animated series and then shots from your best of both worlds um, thing to show sort of how one had inspired the other. But what I wanted to do this time was I actually tried to find shots from the actual episode mm -hmm. and, um, and and then obviously shots that you've done just to show how well you captured um, the, the likeness and the action, but at the same time putting it into that, um, you, you know, the, the, the world of the, uh, of the, the the 70s animation and uh you, you, you know it's just i just thought it was amazing because one of the things i want i want to ask the sort of story here the history because this is obviously even more than twice the length of the scene that you did for yeah. Next Gen, right because yeah. am i right it's about it's nearly six minutes long it is. it is um what i mean knowing what a sort of monumental tasks this is because you you know you hand draw this and you animate it uh -huh. and you thought it's how, how i mean let, let, let's let's sort of rewind straight back so once you decided this was the episode you were going to do mm -hmm. um what was i mean obviously i know the process would have been similar to what it was before but but what i guess what i'm asking is what had you learned from the previous experience that you put into this and also why did you decide to do a scene that was much longer this time around i thought your question was going to be what's wrong with you and that's that would have been an equally appropriate question i don't what, think there's anything you, wrong with you because this, okay. this stuff needs to exist All right so it's right awesome. um <laughs> I okay love creativity. uh six yeah six almost six minutes i mean none of keith none of the process of making the voyager one makes and it, it makes even less sense than the tng one here's why the tng one Part of it came about because it was my wife's birthday. Part mm -hmm. of it came about because I had a little bit of time off work. And, and of course, what do you do when you don't have work is you work? What? What is wrong with me? So, yeah, um, that's why that one happened. And the only reason I had even time, like I had several days where I just committed full days to the TNG one to get it done. Um, whereas other people would have probably gone and seen friends, gone outside. What did I do? I sat there and I did that. And then when the Voyager one came into my brain and finally, um, Lindsay, my wife and Gazelle Automation's uh, co-founder, and we were talking about this Star Trek thing and she is a big Star Trek fan too. And we were saying threshold and we went, oh my God, this is, this is the one to do. And we started talking about this whole kind of like the salamanders and all that stuff. Um, I was busy with work at the time and I had jobs lined up and I was working. And, and, and then of course I have this desire to do um, to show every Voyager character. I, that's what, that was one thing in my head. I was like, the TNG right. one only showed, what, like three or four? Three Le uh, regulars. It was Riker and Picard and Worf, I think. That was it. That's right, yes. And, yeah. and I was kind of like, as a fan, I was like, I want to see everybody in this right. format. And it's, especially if it's going to be a love letter to Voyager, we should see everybody, including Jerry Ryan. We should see everybody. So I'm like, how do I put everybody in this and one thing was well you see Janeway as Janeway um before Paris attacks her in the hallway or kind of attacks whatever uh, abducts her however you want to say it um so I was like I'll start there and then I timed it out and I was like okay so if you start there and you go all the way to the babies the lizard babies you're almost at six minutes and I didn't I wanted to impose the restriction on myself the creative restriction that I couldn't cut anything out so if you okay. play mine and you play the original, they run exactly the same length. It's right, just... exactly like you did with the Ex next gen. Mm -hmm. scene, wasn't it? So yeah. if you give, if you, given all those parameters, I was like, well, there's no way around this. It's going to be about six minutes, and I'm going to do it on weekends or evenings or whenever I have a moment to. Like I remember being stuck in that transporter room. That wasn't even a hard shot to do, but I was like stuck in there for days. I was just like each day I would get a little bit more done, and then I would, you know put it away and then go back to my whatever I was the job I was supposed to be doing I, mean, I, yeah. I know just to be clear I wasn't I'm blowing off work I was working um, but then I would you know <laughs> take the little time draw Neelix on the transporter or Tuvok or whatever and then put it away and then pick it up but I swear it was like three four days of just being stuck in that transporter room like because oh, I could only do a little bit every day 
Um, yeah. And that was frustrating because I was like, I just want to get out of this transporter room and like get to the planet and all that stuff. So, yeah, no, that's cool. That's cool. And, and again, um, you, you know, I, I've watched it. I've, I've played this back a few times. And oh, as I said, you know, with that slide, wh whereas on one hand, you, you've, you've absolutely recreated, um, you know, the shots and, and the scenes, um, at the same time, you, you've also you, you've added quite a few sort of flourishes of your own to this. And mm -hmm. I wanted to ask a little bit about that, because I noticed things like, obviously, at this point in the story, we do not see Tom Paris as Tom Paris that nope. we all know in uniform and all mm -hmm. of this sort of thing, because he's mutated. But what I thought you did, which wasn't in the show in the way you did it, I thought that's amazing is you've got this sort of exposition scene where um, Jakote and the doctor, and I think Kez is in the scene. As Tuvok. Well, talking about, Ke oh, Tuvok, Kez, is, Kez isn't there. Yeah, Tuvok. Kez there. isn't there. Sorry. Yeah. The, the, Tuvok and, and, and the doctor. I love the doctor, by the way, one of my favorite ever characters. Uh, you know, they're, they're having this conversation um, about, you, you know, how um, Tom Paris, you, you know, genetics has evolved and, and, you know, what's happened to him. But what I thought you did that was great and it really made me smile is you cut away to a shot of um, the doctor's view screen and it actually shows uh, like. Tom Paris's Starfleet record yeah, or whatever. Yeah, so you've yeah. got him in, in, in the uniform. Yeah, and yeah. I thought, oh, what a what a great little flourish. So yeah, yeah. And, and Thank you. you added where, where there was just an ensign's voice on the helm when he yeah. when Jacote says pursue the shuttle or whatever. Uh you but you've added again a, a, an extraterrestrial yeah. alien and stuff. Yeah. So yeah, t tell us. Sorry, I'll I'll stop talking. You tell no, me. no, I'm Keith, I'm really um <laughs> chuffed that you caught all those things and kind of like i guess really took in what because like that was all part of the parameter of the tom thing was because i wanted to show every character yeah. or every likeness i should say like every likeness of the of the actors and i was i wasn't happy about just showing paris as that evolved human it just because yeah. that's not what he looks like usually so yeah the 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 um, and this all paris, does come paris fly exactly paris fly exactly thank you <laughs> Um, but this all does come from watching um, probably too many times the animated series and just kind of noticing all those things. Because they, when they, I really wonder, and look, I should know this. I'm sure there's a fan out there. Maybe you know this. The process filmation used for Star Trek, the animated series, I wouldn't be surprised if they put it together like a radio show first. I'm sure they did it in terms of dialogue, but I mean, sometimes the pacing on that show is so bizarre. Like they'll cut to a planet and nothing will happen for 10 seconds and then they'll show up. <laughs> and so it kind of almost makes me think, did they make it like a radio play with sound effects and music and everything? And then the animators were like, here's what we have to sync to. I don't even, because by- That's a good question actually. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. But the thing is by doing it that way, which is how I did it, I found myself going, okay, I've got this big, long, nothing here especially because i'm i'm married to the I, again that creative um restriction i gave myself i'm married to the timing of the original so yeah. if you've got the doctor and chakotay and tuvok talking about this mutation and all it is is three dudes talking i'm like what would the animated series have done to address that and they would have cut away to some monitor or some kind of animation or something yeah um you know i even think about that scene in um yesteryear where they're talking about, yeah, yeah, where they're talking about um, uh, Sarek, and they bring up his, like, um, his photo, right. like on the computer, right? Yes. And it's got that yeah. gr green because it's the seventies. It's got this green background behind him, and I was like, okay, that's what a file photo looks like in TAS. Is this yeah. like just this kind of not even straight on? Sometimes they're like on a little bit of an angle, like they draw them, and then you got a green background. So yeah, you know, um, <laughs> that's brilliant. <laughs> I had to have that. And then, um, yeah, uh, the, the Helms person is the same race as M3 Green, who is a character that David Gerald voiced in the episode The Jihad, which is oh, a wow. okay. second season episode of TAS. And he only shows up in that one episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I like um, it. We, Lindsay and I just love M3 Green, and, uh, and he's voiced by David Gerald. So, you know, what, do you, what more do you want? So we, I, but he's an unnamed species. 
So we right. thought this is a perfect opportunity to show a second member of the species. Um, and also just that voice, the what would have been like a, a looped voice on the original episode of just like yeah, somebody yeah, looping that, that voice. Because again, I'm trying to, it's, it's funny, I'm trying to now divide your version from the from the live action version. And, and I'm, I'm trying to, because I think in the live action version, you don't even see the ensign. No. It's actually like an off, they, they stay on Jakote, don't yeah. they? And it's yeah. like a, an off screen piece of dialogue. Um, yep. But uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, you, you know, little things like that, I thought, fantastic that you'd added those sort of things um to sort of like you said fit the fit the time narrative that you had but likewise bring something new and bring your own sort of flourish to it so yeah. I, I thought i thought that was fabulous the other thing that i picked up on and and again you know you hand drew all of this so it has to be intentional right is one of the things I, uh, that always used to make me laugh um sometimes on the animated series. And I don't know whether it was a, a flopped shot or mm -hmm. whether it was a mistake, but sometimes their rank insignia- Yeah, it would um, be because they appeared, flopped it. Mm -hmm. Appeared on the wrong side, mm -hmm. yeah. And I noticed, I think I managed to find a photo. Well, um, there's one right there, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so, so the, uh, yeah, um, obviously Tuvox uh, communicator is, 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 is on the wrong, wrong breast isn't it yep. the wrong side of his uniform so again and chakotay's tattoo is on the wrong side of his head there you go yes yeah. exactly it's, <laughs> it's it was exactly as you said keith it was a a um budgetary shortcut that filmation used if right. they had drawings of the characters facing one way if they yeah. just flipped the artwork which they would be able to do uh, optically um right. they would save time and they wouldn't have to draw them facing both directions and wow. it also might be look again I feel if, if someone else knows this better than I do, I don't want to like speak it as, as kind of uh, uh, what's the word um, uh, gospel, but it, it's like, yeah, that would save them money to do that, to only have to draw it one way. And then there's also those situations where when they're editing the episode together, maybe they found that having the characters face the other direction um, would make more sense. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny because I don't feel like it happens that much these days in live action, but you probably can think of, older movies where they would do that stuff they would flip the actor because yeah. they actually you know in editing they like oh it actually make more sense if he looks that way right so they yeah, would yeah, flip yeah. them it's, and... a, it's a real problem if they happen to part their hair a certain Ex exactly way. exactly or, or indeed they're wearing some sort of clothing that's not symmetrical mm -hmm. so yeah mm -hmm. yeah and, um, and most people like it, i'm sure the, the casual casual viewer it might get by them but it's something that i noticed uh, and, and I think a lot of people in the comments uh, on the Voyager video noticed a lot on the Filmation series is that they would flop artwork like that. Yeah. And you'd have writing backwards and you'd have all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. 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 Now it happens. I mean, it's all to do with crossing the line in filmmaking. Mm -hmm. or, or exactly. Like, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, it happens. And sometimes it's more more distracting if the character's looking in the wrong place than it is if they've got like something on you know a pocket on the wrong side mm -hmm. or, or, or whatever you know mm -hmm. a patch on the wrong side whatever yeah. it is but yeah so so that was one of the things i noticed the other thing that i absolutely loved because of course it doesn't happen in the episode um the live action one but i i just love the fact that you managed to get obviously we've seen like kirk do this a few times in it, well, you know voyage home springs to mind and whatever but i actually found one to be more appropriate a picture of tom paris yeah. doing it there you, you did the uh you, you know the, the 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 face um the hand over the mouth kind yep. of gesture yeah. which again was an absolutely appropriate beat but uh uh, again, that 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 made me laugh because that was obviously a clear homage as well, right? It's a very like filmation episodes use that more than once, where Kirk's hand very awkwardly comes up, and they they definitely didn't do multiple frames of that. They slid the sl the the cell for sure because it's the same piece of artwork just coming up over his face, um, right. and it's and it's it's kind of awkward and it's funny for and of course in this scenario it's funny because Chakotay is. Uh, probably more a little bit more um i suppose outwardly reactive to what he's seeing i i think again that's the thing about animation in this style is that um i think any animation but especially in this style is that you do have to be bigger and that is why you have to cut away to more things and that's why you have to um have i think bigger reactions because the actors the live actors can do very subtle things in their face you know mm -hmm. it's the same reason why i showed 
um, mutant Paris kind of watching Janeway in the hallway as opposed to what is in the actual episode, which is Kate exactly doing the run. Kate Mulgrew in the real episode does a lot of subtle acting where she's kind of standing there going, oh, is someone behind me? And yes, then she grabs exactly. her face. And, I, and it's yeah. very hard in this style to hold on somebody that long. Yes. You know, without having a lot more drawings or a lot more business. And so, you know, that's why um, I feel like all of it has to be bigger. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, it, it, it just works, you know, as I said, you know, particularly particularly when you're familiar with the, 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 the 70s animated show anyway. But also, yeah, with what you've done in the episode, it all it all works so well. And uh, yeah, I, I was I Thanks, was man. grinning from ear to ear when I was watching this stuff because I was like, this is brilliant. And that's why I thought I've got to have you if you agree to it. I've got to have you come on again. You know, thanks. Um, the next thing I want to talk about with, with regards to this whole process and mm. everything is um, we'll get to music, mm. but is also sound effects. Because, yeah. again, I was trying to sort of figure this out. So we have the sound effects that that exist in Voyager, you know, the world of the 24th century Star Trek um, era. Right. So the, mm -hmm. the sound sounds of the you know, the phases, the various sounds on the bridge and on the ship and all this. But it sounds to me like you also managed to put in some of the sort of more retro sounds from the um, set, uh, from the animated series. And I'm thinking particularly when they transported down to the planet, I felt yeah. like there was something else in the mix there. So yeah. was was that me hearing that correctly? Or oh, yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that's also why I mean. <laughs> To kind of waywardly answer your question, because I've seen yeah. a few, not a lot, but just one or two people asking, why didn't you put L cars in this? And, you know, Mike oh, Okuda's L car designs. And yes. the thing is, when this is a tasting, of course, is like if somebody else, even crazier than me or just as crazy, had made this themselves, they might have gone a different route with this. But my feeling about it was I even down to the copyright date at the beginning saying 1990, what did it say? Six or seven, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, Cause like whatever year threshold came out. Um, 96, I'm, I'm, right. I'm trying to skirt this. It's like this weird alternate universe is what this cartoon came from where it's like the seventies, but it's the nineties, but it's like, you know, it's kind of, so Voyager is very much a product of the nineties. And I think we can all agree, like even the production design, the costumes, the hair, everything comes from that era, even yes. though they were trying to, futurize it you can't pretend you know completely eliminate it, that kind of core feeling of the 90s and the cartoon has the 70s feel and mm -hmm. so trying to find this exactly like you were saying it's like the sound effects the design of everything has to kind of somehow meet in the middle and mm -hmm. so i found that if i used like i was going to use voyager's bridge ambient sound which i did i was not going to use kirk's bridge ambience because that doesn't make sense in my brain yeah but then when they went to beam i was like could i do the voyager transporter and filmation style and i was like well they wouldn't have done that it's it's too expensive to have those yes. balls the yeah. spherical balls i was like no no no, they wouldn't have done that and then i'm looking at how they did the transporter for tas and it's like they've got this piece of artwork this like um what is it like uh sparkles sparkle artwork that they've kind of like moved every frame to make it look like it's glittering, right? And you can kind of see sometimes it's just a piece of artwork that's jittering around. And they've got like mats for the characters that are not quite lined up optically. Um, and I thought, well, that's how they would do this for sure. For any, if, if someone had come to Filmation and said, make us a Voyager cartoon, they would have been like, hey, we already know how to do the transporter. We'll just do it the same way. You know, it's the same reason why several people have pointed out, like, shouldn't the um, Voyager nacelles be like this when they're at warp in this cartoon and i thought well i don't think my feeling people would disagree but my feeling is filmation wouldn't have done that they wouldn't have kept that part of the storytelling because it adds expense to the production and then you cool. end up having more mistakes like oh it should be here when it's here or whatever so yeah 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 that's yeah. how i thought about it no no mm -hmm. that, that, that that i mean it worked really well because as i said it was it was noticeable but not distracting if, if, if that makes sense and mm -hmm. um and 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 obviously you're right. The visual I hadn't even thought about that, but yes, the 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 actual because I was thinking of it from the sound effect side of things. But you're absolutely right as well. The visual that you use was more of the how they did it in the 
uh, TAS rather yeah. than how they actually do it in the next gen era of, of Star Trek. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that, that, that was good. And then the, the other thing um, we've really got to talk about because, because, oh, this again, I, I get chills. I get goosebumps with this stuff. So um, I know for Voyager, Jerry Goldsmith did the theme, which is obviously yes. iconic. Yes. But I think it was it was either Jay Chataway or Dennis McCarthy. That this did. episode was scored by Chataway. I'm, Jay, 100%, okay. I'm 100% sure. Yes. Yeah, no, I, 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 I mm-hmm. think so. I, I, as I said, I know they kind of, that they, they sort of did a few episodes each, didn't yep. they, across the run. And then there was and David Bell in there, and they, you know, there was several other composers that kind of... Right, right. But this point. obviously... You've removed all of that and you've got the, and I think the, again, I hope I've got the composer's name right. Is it Ray Ellis? That That's did it. The yeah, music yeah, yeah. The, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which, which I have to say, I love. I mean, what, what I love about that is it's kind of, you know, it, it almost sounds like some, it's incredibly repetitive and it mm. sounds like some sort of stock music, but at yeah. the same time, it, it it always to me i don't know whether this is my child brain but it always sounded like a serious piece of action music and mm-hmm. i love it mm-hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. and uh, you obviously rescored this whole thing with that so mm-hmm. um how, i mean how complicated was that from a mixing point of view uh this one was way harder than uh the borg episode it, right. and i think that's down to the way the episode is mixed and the the source of audio that I got and all those, there's a lot of parameters that um, that come into play when you're trying to pull dialogue, clean the other stuff out of it. Um, And I don't profess to be like, I'm not an audio. Like I don't, I only do audio as part of my job. So like I I have like a enough of a working knowledge of it, but I'm sure that there are other people, there are other people um, who I've worked with who do incredible you know, um, Mark Ayers, who I worked with on Thunderbirds, he does like stuff with Doctor Who and things like that. And he's done crazy, you know, r- taking Beatles songs out of the audio, you know, with dialogue on top of it and stuff like that, like crazy stuff like that. But right. this was, um, I have to thank Jay Chataway. I mean, for many reasons, because I, I mean, he's a great composer and his work on Star Trek is wonderful. Yes. But in this case, and I think in a lot of his scores, he is a very... I know the house style of Star Trek was set at this point, mu- musically. Um, mm-hmm. And so they, they, they did tend to do a lot of long holds on chords and very kind of, if I may say so, pad, pad-like pad type music, which you have the like, violins and the cellos and the you know, horns and everything just holding this note and then they hold that note. And because I wasn't able to extract the dialogue as easily as I did from Best of Both Worlds, I had to do a lot more manual literally going through Garrett Wong's like talking and see those notes and then just isolate the notes and remove them. But because they were long holds, it actually made it way more doable. If they had been like very melodic music, I think I would have been in huge trouble, but sometimes they were talking on the bridge and there would be this one chord that would just hold all the way through the line. I said, Oh, thank goodness. And I could just get rid of it. So, right. Yeah. But it was, it was, difficult and then of course you test it with the Ray Ellis music to go is it close enough to clean that I can cover it with having another piece of music under yeah. there yeah and, so, and, well, yeah and also the thing that you again got that was sort of spot on with the 70s um uh animated series was uh I, I you know I've said I, I'm sort of going to contradict myself here because I said that you know the music always seemed very serious but in in those cartoons or those animated shows they would sometimes, because it was really aimed at kids, let's be honest, although I still think some of the episodes... It was into- aimed at, I think, I guess they, 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 the production said they wrote them like they were just writing Star Trek. Like oh. they just, like the same staff, the same every... But you're right, like there's obviously more than one piece of that puzzle that's producing yes. that show. And it was on a Saturday morning time slot. Yes. And it was done in animation. So yes, so there is that sensibility to it for sure yeah i mean sometimes sometimes an episode and i mean that they even did this in the live action one anyway but mm-hmm. you know sometimes an episode would end on a on a lighter note you know like a comedy beat usually usually with kirk spock and bones in yes, the original yes. but in this one it was almost perfect where you've got tuvok and jacote and he says mm, i'm not sure i'm gonna sort of enter this into my log and mm. but then you also put in a um again i think it's still ray ellis from the cartoon it but it's almost like this sort of comedy beat of music at the end when you yep. see the um the 
what are they called? The things the, the, they babies, evolved, the babies. The babies. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> the babies that, that have that have been left behind forever. You know, unless Prodigy goes back and finds them, who knows? Oh, there's but, there's, there's an idea. Oof, yeah. I, maybe they are going to do that, but um, but yeah, they they uh, I, 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 that decision to put that music there, I really wondered if I was going too far, and I played it for Lindsay, and she said, "Absolutely right, just do it." Like this is yeah. like go like everything's got to it's a cartoon, everything's got to be a bit bigger. And you're right, so the original series, um, I mean, also have you know because we produced those the Thunderbirds episodes for ITV. Right stuff that's older like 60s 70s like everything was more on the nose and so if you had a funny moment at the end of star trek or thunderbirds or whatever you would put wah 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 or whatever you put there right and that was just how people used to do it and so it feels anytime and i did have these moments multiple times doing voyager i think even more than tng um anytime it felt like it was getting too into the contemporary 290s i had to do something to pull it back you know yeah. so whether it was sound effects, whether it was color palette, there was like, there were certain moments when I was drawing something and I'd go, Ooh, cause the design is inherently nineties. Mm -hmm. So what, what can I do to just pull it back to the seventies feeling? So it doesn't start to feel like, like a nineties cartoon. And right. so you do those things, put that funny music at the end and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. know oh, it totally worked. It totally worked. And, and it just made me laugh this episode. Cause I thought to myself, um, you, you know, Tom Paris, uh, you know, before he, before he ends up with Kess in a in an alternate timeline, oh, yes. and mm -hmm. before he ends up with Balana Taurus later in the series, actually he kind of in this one had a thing with Janeway. Yes, and it's like, yes, Good Lord. <laughs> yes, or or she had a thing with him because again, as they say at the end of the episode, and I can't believe I'm even quoting their script, but yeah, she says yeah. I might have initiated it. They don't know who started that's, what, so that's right because they were oh. both in their. I was going to say not right minds, but I guess they're ev evolved minds, whatever the hell that episode doesn't make any sense. It doesn't Hilarious. Make any sense. Yeah. Hilarious. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad and grateful that the fan base, like the majority of people have understood this is a love letter to Voyager. It's not yeah. in any way kind of, you know, we, we can laugh at this particular episode being a bit of a train wreck because it is, but it's like, it's certainly, you know, it's still kind of a celebration of, of that show i have no doubt that you have made the episode suddenly more popular on, on the netflix playlists because i as i said it made me go back specifically to watch it i think pete may have done the same because he was originally going to be on this stream as well so i think he went back and watched it hey awesome um, as as well so so that's quite hilarious um a couple more stylistic questions mm. i do want to ask though is um, obviously, again, so I, I didn't find a picture of this to, to show, but um, again, you know, with the com badges, they're slightly oversized, yeah. in some drop, <laughs> yeah. then, you know, like, like yeah. the animated series did. But also in terms of the color palette. So here's the thing. Uh, I love it that the Doctor's in this because I think Robert Picardo and that character was 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 just genius. I, I loved it. He is. Um, he is so. If we want to take a moment to do a Robert Picardo appreciation, I mean, I appreciate all the actors. Star Trek historically, um, I mean, always has cast really, really, really good actors. It's just something that they do. Like you, you need good actors to do this storytelling. Um, but Bob Picardo, I mean, again, just like you know Brent Spiner with Data, and I even said it at the time. He was like, I, I'm so. I think he said he was lucky that he got that character, but also yeah. that he did. He did so much with that character. I mean, obviously, where that character went is because of him. Like, his ideas, what he wanted to do with it. And there was so many, even in the early seasons of Voyager, as we were watching through our Trekathon, um, seeing what he did with nothing. Like, nothing. He, he would be in the background. They'd give him one line, and he would find a way to make it funny or poignant or something. And you'd just go, wow, that's, that, yeah. like, that is amazing. You know, with this yeah. little, you know, oh, it's look, sarcasm. whatever. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I seem to remember in a season one episode, you know, before he had a hollow emitter or anything yeah, yeah, like yeah. that, uh, he's on a view screen and 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 in the um, in the conference room, and you, you know, all of the senior officers are discussing something, and they're not listening to him, and he ends up like waving <laughs> That's at the, on the camera. Bridge. <laughs> it's actually on the bridge. He's on the view screen on the bridge, and they're all at, at, oh, the, right, yeah. at the engineering section, and yeah, he's literally doing this in the background, which is like just. <laughs> 
I, I know what I don't want to like, obviously it might've been the direction. It might've been whatever, but like Bob Picardo brought so much of that. And so I think actually, um, not to go into too much of a tangent here, because you were talking about color palette, that's that, right. that scene where in, in sick bay for the very limited amount of expression and animation that I could get out of this style. And they are very kind of, you know, limited. Um, actually similarly to the Thunderbirds puppets, maybe that's another reason why my brain works that way. Um, I enjoyed that when the doctor starts to talk about his um, anti-proton therapy for, for Paris, I, I made him smile and close his eyes as if he was a little bit arrogant as he was saying it. Because I thought, I mean, he, he doesn't do it like that in the episode, but I was like, but that's right. something the doctor would do. It's totally, a little yeah. bit full of himself, yeah. right? Yeah. No, I mean, the, 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 the color palette question, the reason I was focusing on the doctor, because he's the only one with the sort of, uh, you, you know, the, the, the blue shoulders, if yes. you like. And, mm -hmm. it, and it's quite funny because this whole thing with the, the uniform colors, particularly in the next gen era, um, because of the film stock and the transfers and the lighting and all of this, mm -hmm. you, you know, particularly if you go to conventions, you'll see people make uniforms and they're all in a slightly different color. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a green, sometimes yep. it's blue. You know, I think the yeah. actual color was supposed to be teal, which is kind yeah. of a mixture of the two. But I noticed you, you stuck with the hard blue, like yep. the Spock yep. blue on this. Again, presumably that was in entirely intentional right 100 percent. because yeah. uh keith you nailed it by saying the word teal teal is a 90s color and <laughs> i grew up i had my, my my family had a teal minivan like it, teal was like there was teal at the mall there was teal like everything was teal and <laughs> you can't get away from the 90s if you put teal in there so i you know and i think that you're right there's something kind of strange that happened well what am i saying strange the 90s had teal that's, I think I just answered my own question because teal and burgundy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, two colors Friends. in the cars. My family cars growing up, burgundy first, and then teal. No kidding. So <laughs> they were those colors. And so the last thing I'd want to do is, and that's why even in the TNG one, I didn't make the uniforms burgundy. I made them red, like the red of the yeah. TAS um, palette. And so yeah. it's interesting when I think about like Dr. Crusher, she's wearing a blue uniform. feel like they're wearing um did we freeze for a second it's right just for a second you're yeah. back you're back um yeah, yeah when you get he's to ds9 territory a blue uniform yeah, yeah. But... when you when you get into ds9 territory and voyager doesn't it, it, it just like you said it really reads more like a teal greenish kind of thing but yeah. um so yeah when i put those shoulders on him i thought it looks a bit weird but i'm not putting teal in this there's no way yeah. i'm putting teal in this Oh, great. No, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad these things were sort of because uh, I just wondered if it was me just being a total nerd or no. Or... every I think the funny thing is like people from the comments I've read, they, they you know, people say, you know, was this intentional? Was this intentional? And basically, yes, the, the overall answer is like, especially because it's done this way without having to worry about film stock, without having to worry about um, different uh, optical uh, processes changing the color. Yes. Um, any of those kinds of decisions or mistakes or whatever, they all have to be intentional and hilariously sometimes add more work to the yeah. product. I know. I mean, I mean, everything because because you've created this, you know, literally everything that is seen and heard is 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 by design. And I mm. mean, that's, that's that's what's so that's what's so fantastic about this. And um uh well, thanks, you, you know, we're really happy to see them. Um, I, I think one of the questions I wanted to ask you though about this was um so was the intention because you said you started another episode I, mm -hmm. I won't i won't put you on the spot and ask you i can't, I can't say which one it is can't oh, say no, which fair one enough is. fair yeah. enough but what was the decision then so you've done next gen so mm -hmm. what was the decision to do voyager because i i know from i've read some of the comments that you've had on your um your channel mm. and i know that you are getting a lot of fan um not pressure, but a lot of fan suggestion. Mm. Oh yeah, like I and I yes nine. <laughs> well, I I mean I knew that um, that was one thing I was kind of scared of doing a second one is that the first one was a novelty that no one had seen before. Yes, where no one has watched before. Sorry, watched before. Yeah, and like... <laughs> and yeah, I mean, look, I don't. I, I sound so hoity-toity on my own. Like I just made a stupid little cartoon, but it did get you know. I was very happy by the reception, but I knew that if I did a second one. There'd be a lot more like, like, honestly, like, again, not to 
to it's, it is apples and oranges, but the, the showrunners that make Star Trek right now and Star Wars and all these legacy um, brands, they've got what a difficult job. The longer something exists, and especially today with the internet, like I just had to put one cartoon out and suddenly I knew people would have a lot of opinions. And thankfully, again, majority, majority of people uh, very much love the threshold thing and I'm so happy about it. Um, but I knew there was going to be this, you know, some people would say, why didn't you do DS9? Or are you going to do DS9? Or, um, and I definitely didn't. Um, well, I was thinking more because DS9 it. was the next show. That, that I mean, was the, more my, you, you mm -hmm. know, in the chronology, if you like, they did Next Gen and then mm -hmm. DS9, then Voyager. So that and was I'm, kind of... I didn't know. think of it at all in a chronological sense. I think right. it always was like, I did Best of Both Worlds because I thought, what's like something that like, 90s era trek what is like the most well-known episode and i was like it's probably that one mm -hmm. um and i think it lends itself well to that because it is kind of comic booky if you will in the it's not the inner light like, you know that's another popular episode but like you right. wouldn't right. take something that's so performance driven and try mm -hmm. to do an animation even though yesteryear the animated episode is pretty much that um it's uh, you know best of both worlds is this great kind of balance of it gets a kind of big action and the borg are they're not hokey but you you could make them hokey a little bit you know like they're you know there's a this larger than life aspect to that comic booky situation sure. um so that was the obvious thing to, to do first and it wasn't about the chronology of um because i suppose i could have also done it with like one of the the movies i could have taken like wrath of khan or i could have taken like oh. you know right oh, but i didn't yeah. but i didn't think that way i was kind of going well what's the thing that's like really you know and what what also would really juxtapose these two styles yeah is like the further i go without going to like the the new stuff because the new stuff is so new i was like if i took that 90s stuff and put it to the 70s thing like what would happen so mm -hmm. it was ne there was never a chronological uh, consideration which is why i at first when i saw people saying why did you skip ds9 i thought i didn't really uh skip it um incidentally not to say that i uh will or won't do a ds9 one but if i do <laughs> um if i happen to pick an episode of ds9 that came out after threshold i'm still chronologically correct so yeah, <laughs> yeah, they really are yes yeah they could have maybe gray um gray yeah. Uh, yeah. shoulders or, or or you could do it in pink sorry <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, and there's that whole thing. Like, I still see people saying it's it's because the art, you know, art director, the director was colorblind, and I just like I, I, my take on this is that it's not true. But there's there's conflicting stories. DC Fontana says it on the DVD. Yeah, there's yeah. But then the mission log guys say that it's not a thing. And I look as an animator. Yeah. I my gut feeling is that he was not colorblind, and the reason I say this is because. You would have had, first of all, there are things in TAS that are gray that are gray, like not just background things, but foreground things that are gray and are gray. Yeah. So the fact that the Klingons have pink and purple and the fact that the Kazinti have pink and purple and, and certain things in the show are pink and purple, um, it doesn't make sense to me that only sometimes you would get it wrong if yeah. there are gray things. And then the other thing is those. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there might be an animator who worked at Filmation who's going to be like, no, or maybe yes. But um, they would have had ink pots. You know, they would have had specific colors yes. that they were using. It just doesn't make sense to me that you would work in that field. At some point, someone would go, oh, he's, he's mixing these colors up and they would, you know, or whatever. So, yeah. Well, um, it's a weird, it's a weird yeah. thing because gray, you, you know, like in, in the um, uh, Voyager and, and early... Um, uh, DS9 era, you, you know, they had the sort of tunics under the uniforms yep. and those things. I mean, they were supposed to be gray, I guess, but they look purple I think shows where they look purple. Yeah. yeah shows yep. where they look sort of violet colored. Yeah. Um, you, you know, all sorts of things. So, again, it's, it's a really it's a really weird color because it's yeah. it, it's it's tricky, isn't it? But uh, and I, I, so I'm not weighing in definitively on this, but I guess my personal feeling is that it's not a true story. And it might honestly be um, that DC Fontana might have heard it from somebody because she was on the writing staff. She wasn't actually, I mean, again, yes. I don't want to be quoted on any of this, but I, my feeling is like as an animator working in animation, uh, like in like the industry, like you wouldn't, 
I just don't think that mistake would have would have happened in that kind of way multiple times, you know, anyway. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I could literally talk to you. I, I have no doubt all evening about all these things and different stories. And, and I was I was even going to ask you about these on, on Blu-ray and stuff. But if you um, haven't got it yet, Keith, you should. It's worth yeah, it. It's yeah. Totally no, worth I it. Mean, OK, cool. That's good to know. Um, <laughs> but, uh, are you so so how long roughly then did this this whole six minute piece take you? Do you think uh, you had to put hours and days on it? Ooh. Or weeks well the first um, one took me i think like a solid week end to end like if you just like took full days and crammed them together i think it was about a week of work right and this one took more than twice that length and i think for many reasons it has more characters more backgrounds more i mean i did i should clarify that i did lift some backgrounds from tas which i thought is what they would have done they would have yeah. recycled stuff but yeah. any of the voyager backgrounds like the hallway the bridge which took a long time I made even more work for myself after I was almost done by adding the overhead shot that, yes. that overhead shot, which, which which took so long, but I was like, oh, I want to do it. I want to see, they, they never had an overhead shot on Voyager. I want to see Actually, what that they looks didn't, like. Did they? No. no, that's true. And that's, yeah. I mean, but yeah. I don't cool. think so anyway. I don't think and, so. And Harry Kim's station and whatever was kind of, you know, there's a lot going on there, isn't there? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And, and so it was over well over two weeks for this. So it wasn't just double of the first one. It was definitely longer than double in terms of how long it took. And then even just kind of, um, and it was hard to draw certain characters, you know, like drawing Janeway as a cartoon, uh, that was difficult. And even like yeah, any of the characters, like I, I think I had a little trouble with, with Robert Picardo as well. Like you just want to pick the right um, features on that face to uh yeah. to emphasize and also like I, I do feel like the tas characters like shatner kirk on the on the animated series do you think that c cartoon character looks like shatner not really no yeah right <laughs> so and and i don't think that the, the that spock looks like nimoy really like he kind of does but he kind of doesn't so you're trying to hit yeah. this this um middle ground where you still know who they are yeah. And of course, like there's sometimes in TAS where the, the face just like between shots looks like a completely different person. So yeah. you're trying to like all that stuff has to come through. Like it can't look so perfect in detailed. So, yeah, it was yeah. it was uh, I don't know. I want to say yeah. three weeks if you put it end to end, maybe three oh, weeks. Wow. OK, maybe wow, four. That. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of work, but it looks great. I mean, unfortunately, I haven't got Picardo on here. I was I was I was scrambling to sort of find some some, some oh, this is images, super but... cool. But the Janeway, I mean, you've, you know, I put I put a picture of Kate Mulgrew. I don't think it's actually from the same episode, but I right. put them side by side there because I think I think you've totally captured Janeway um, completely, you know. And the same with Jakote and and um, Tuvok, you know, all of them there. That looks that looks amazing. And I kind of like the fact that you did your own version of the uh, the amphibian uh, Paris again to make it well, in my mind, feel more like that sort of seventies era um filmation animation um type of thing so that's awesome but uh, are you able to tell us what you're working on now or anything yeah anything else is we um up? we are working on a bunch of things uh mm -hmm. which is uh why we've been busy we're, we're doing a a puppet sci-fi i might have mentioned this last time puppet sci-fi opera project for an opera company in canada um, right. which sounds totally like you've probably never heard this before but it's like for, for family audiences. This is one project we're doing. It's called Three Penny Submarine. It's for an opera company called Opera 5. And okay. it's about this fox and a cockatiel exploring the deep sea. And it's like science fiction. So, and we're doing it with puppets and models. Oh, right. the model miniature is actually over there right now. Um, and, uh, and they sing arias when they really want to express themselves. And so that is a show that we're doing eight episodes of right now. And then we're also... Um, so that's a thing for Opera 5. So that's not our own creative. They created that show. But, right. but Lindsay and I are also st starting on a project called Space Bow. That's B-A-O. Um, Space Bow, I'm very excited about this. It's a science fiction, like food delivery in space, like food couriers in space. <laughs> and all the characters are like anthropomorphic animals like Star Fox. So they oh, like wow. race around the galaxy, like delivering food. And so we follow this ragtag space bow. It's the name of the company. And they're 
they're like the bottom of the the rung. They're trying to make it, you know, as this food delivery, you know, company. Um, and uh, they accidentally get sucked into a two dimensional universe. So they're three dimensional. They're done with puppets and models, and then they're going to transition into this almost like filmation, if I will, if if you will, world. So they're going to have puppets and models and and a cartoon all and at the same you do time. all of this in your own studio with with just you and your wife you? um well depending on the project we scale up and we scale down actually you've got mikshi up there and mikshi that oh, um, no, uh, yeah there we go. yeah sorry, mikshi yeah. which is the, the the shy sheep inventor with the red glasses she yeah. um that that series we we did that with the uh, canadian broadcaster tvo and uh shaftesbury which is a canadian production company was our, our co-production uh co-producer i should say and that was like we scaled up for that like i think at one point we had <laughs> shockingly 20 something people working on the show which i know for for us is a lot so for space bow we would scale up as required um and uh you know we've got usual same old um you know everyone's sc scrambling for funding and things like that but everyone has that problem but uh um the big the big dream keith is that is to have will wheaton do a guest voice on Space Bow. That is our big dream oh, right. right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It may be an unattainable dream, but Will Wheaton did post a, a blog entry about the first TNG filmation yes. cartoon and a post about, um, he posted on Facebook about the Voyager one. Yeah, so, and you added you added him, didn't you, on your, um, you've got a behind the scenes, yeah. um, which again, I'll put a link in the show notes. I encourage anyone that's interested in this sort of thing to, to check that out, but you you did add Will Wheaton to it, didn't you? When, By his sure, request, when, when Russia. You yes, added to he yes. he wanted to see himself as a filmation character, and I thought, yeah. well, I'll do it. I, um, I I've got all the time in the world for Wesley Crusher. I really do. So yeah, I yeah, yeah. It. Well, and and I guess uh, I don't want to do spoilers here, but you've seen Picard, right? Yeah, I, oh, yeah. We we don't have to talk about that in uh, case people haven't. Yeah. That, uh, okay, yeah. fair enough. Um, so people can find your work then at gazelleautomations.com. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yep. yep. If you're fans of Doctor Who, if you're fans of Thunderbirds, if you're fans of um, Short Circuit, it's a, I don't know why my voice cracked there. It's probably because like that harkens back to my childhood. But um, actually, got can I reach him? I don't. Does, you've never have you seen these this movie? You seen no, this yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I was a big you know I grew up with these films. So yeah. And yeah. uh, also, um, I've had uh, Kenneth Johnson who did. Oh, the, had him on. The, uh, he's he was on a podcast show that I used to do because oh, cool. I'm, I'm a big fan of you know the Incredible Hulk and the Six Million Dollar Man and mm -hmm. you know all of that sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, in the, yeah. So, and he worked um, on all that stuff. Yeah, and, but and then, um, of course, he directed the sequel. Didn't yeah, he? that so. that one I can't remember if I mentioned this on the last uh, time I was here. That's one of the ones from the movie. That one. Ah, right. Yeah, okay. So cool. and and that was so anyway. If you're interested in any that kind of stuff, animation, puppets, models. You can find stuff at our website, as you said, gazelleautomations.com. Yeah, now I'll, what I'll do is I'll put, as I said, I'll put links in this and I'll also, I'll probably um, add a card at the end of the video as well that links to your um, episode. Yeah, uh, and cool. also, certainly the, and also the previous episode that you were on with, with myself and Pete. Oh, yeah. so mm -hmm. I'll do that. Um, so yeah, if you do want to get in touch with the channel, uh, you can reach us at lswotcast uh, at gmail.com. That's let's see what's out there, cast at gmail.com. And follow us at lswotcast on all of the social medias. Obviously, you're on this channel, Home Media Minefield. Uh, please do check out. I talk about physical media on this channel as well as, you know, interviews and discussion shows like Star Wars and Star Trek, amongst others. Um, I want to say thank you as well to New Neil Myers, who did the uh, intro, outro music that we use. Uh, his work can be found at neilmyersmusic.com. And I want to thank William McLaughlin for our logo. Um, and also Pete, who, as I said, couldn't join us today. You can follow him at social media on too many e at too many e's. And uh, I can assure you that has nothing to do with the fact that uh, that he's not on today. <laughs> His name so, does have a lot of ease in it. It does have a lot of uh, ease yeah. in it. Uh, also, I do have another channel, British Isles, which is E-Y-L-E-S, as in my last name. So if you want to check out any of the um, uh, creative work, short films and stuff that I've done, 
please go and check that out there. And uh, yeah, you know, we, we're just grateful for views and comments and all of that sort of stuff. So um, that just really leaves me to say thank you, Justin. Once again, you've been very generous with your time. Thank I you do for having like me, Keith. Talk. I, I, I feel like this conversation could go on and on, but uh, I I do realize you've, you've got a life there. So. <laughs> I just, I just I thought will... number five should say bye. You're going to say bye? Yeah, bye from, from say, say bye number five. Yeah. You can't, you <laughs> can't raise your hand. Number five is alive. Yeah. Thanks very much. And, thank, uh, you, thank you for having me, Keith. No, that was really fun. It was super, super No fun. problem. Yeah. And we will see you on the next uh, edition of Let's See What's Out There. Oh, there we go. Let's, let's do Vulcan Hands. Yes, indeed. Bye for now. <laughs>